All rise. The Honorable Supreme Court of Georgia is now in session. Chief Justice Hugh Thompson is providing. You may be seated. all of the judges and citizens of this circuit. We are so glad that you're here. For many of the citizens who are in the room today, including many lawyers, they have never had the opportunity to see our highest court work. It's extremely important to all of us that they not only know how the executive branch, the legislative branch, but the judicial branch works. So we are honored for you to be here today we hope that you enjoy our facilities. We're extremely proud of the Denver County Courthouse. And if there's anything that the judges can do to make your visit easier, please let us know. But on behalf of everyone in this room, welcome to Denver County. Thank you, Judge Weaver. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. We welcome each and every one of you to the session of argument for the Supreme Court of Georgia. On behalf of my colleagues, I want to welcome all of you to this special session, and it is special for us as well, of the Supreme Court of Georgia. Before we begin, let me introduce you to the court. To my right is Presiding Justice Harris Hines from Marietta, Cobb County, Georgia. He, is, uh, he has undergraduate and law degrees from Emory University. Some people call him a double eagle. <laughs> Justice Robert Bennett to my left, is from Connorsville, Bartow County, Georgia, with undergraduate degrees from Tuskegee University, a law degree from the University of Georgia. On the other side of presiding Justice Hines is Justice Carol Hunstein from Decatur, Decatur County, Georgia, with undergraduate degree from Florida Atlantic University, a law degree from Stetson University. And on the other side of Justice Benham is our colleague, Justice Harold Melton from Atlanta, Fulton County, Georgia, with undergraduate degree from Auburn University and a law degree from the University of Georgia. On my far right is Justice Davis, David Namias from Dunwoody, DeKalb County, Georgia, undergraduate degree from Duke University and a law degree from Harvard University. And on my far left is our newest justice, Justice Keith Blackwell from Smyrna, Cobb County, Georgia, undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Georgia. He's a double dog. Our <laughs> colleague, that uh, whole colleague that I'm going to introduce in a few minutes is another double dog, just to show you probably, but, uh, And I'm Hugh Thompson. I'm from Milledgeville, Baltimore County, Georgia. I did my undergraduate uh, studies at Emory University and Oglethorpe University, and I studied <coughs> law at Mercy University down in Macon. We owe special thanks to Chief Judge Brenda Weaver of the Appalachian Judicial Circuit, as well as Judge Roger Bradley and Judge Amanda Mercier, who are all seen together, and we're delighted to see all of you together, who invited us to hold court in this most magnificent part of our state. This is a truly historic occasion for the court. We believe this is the first time the Supreme Court of Georgia has ever been in the Appalachian Judicial Circuit for a special term of court. And it's fitting that we're holding court in this great 21st century courthouse that stands at the very same location as the original 1898 courthouse. How exciting it is to be in this beautiful, clean, mountainous region of North Georgia. And how delighted it is to be in our state's apple capital. Just as you are celebrating the 44th annual Georgia Apple Festival. I can tell you we're all taking apples back home with us. <laughs> Thank you for sharing uh, God's bounty with us in that way. 
Last night we had a wonderful dinner at the Black Sheep Restaurant in Blue Ridge, and my colleagues and I are extremely grateful for the warm welcome you have given us. This morning, I would like to acknowledge those providing security for the special event, including Gilbert County Sheriff Stacy Nicholson, Bannon County Sheriff Dane Kirby, Pickens County Sheriff Danny Craig. Also with us are State Troopers James Brown, Nolan Lundy, and in addition, we're grateful to have three police chiefs here today, Chief Edward Lacey of LJ, Chief Greg Lovell of Jasper, and Chief Larry Bennett of McKinney, <coughs> as well as Post Commander Kevin Johnson of the Georgia State Patrol. I also want to give thanks to all, and special thanks to all, um, in particular, uh, the men and women of all of their departments who are with us ensuring the safety and security of this proceeding out of our time here. We also have many distinguished guests here this morning, and I ask your forgiveness ahead of time for not being able to name each one of you individually due to time constraints of so many of you, but instead I'm going to ask you to stand uh, in groups as you recognize. I would like to thank the Superior Court judges and let me ask all Superior Court judges if you would please stand. Thank you for coming. We will today. Would the Juvenile Court, Magistrate Court, and Probate Judges, and any other judges please stand? Thank all of you. I, I recognize many of you, and uh, as I did this other group, thank you for coming to be with us today. Thank you for the work you do. I believe we have the chairman of both Gilmer County and Pickens County Boards of Commissioners with us today, as well as some of their commissioners. Would the commissioners please stand? Thank you for being with us, and thank you for the job you do as well. Would uh, Mayor Tom Seabolt of McKaysville and Mayor John Weaver of Jasper please stand if you're here today? Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the job you do as well. Finally, I'd like to ask District Attorney Allison Sosby and Circuit Public Defender Michael Carl and any other public officials being uh, who are with us today, if you would please stand. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. We're grateful to all of you for your service to this community and to the people of Georgia. All of you are important very important to the, your communities and to our state as well. We're also honored, as I mentioned earlier, to have with us former Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court, George Carl. Justice Carl, you can stand. Thank you for being here. He's seated with John Salmon, former president of the State Bar of Georgia, who lives right over in Morganton now. John Salmon, thank you. And we're delighted to have the parents of Justice Keith Blackwell, who's our newest justice, um, would Robert and Peggy Blackwell please stand. Thank you. And thank you for uh, sending us such a fine uh, member of the court. Uh, I'm going to digress just a little bit, but i got to say this. Just, justice Blackwell, um, was a valedictorian of his high school class in Kent. He was the number one graduate from the University of Georgia's undergrad. He was number one in his class in the law school class over there as well. So he's quite a scholar, but he's a fine young man too. I appreciate you letting us let you choose him. Okay. Finally, I want to give a special welcome this morning to about 30 students from Gilmer, Pickens, and Phoenix County. Let me ask students from Gilman County, if you would please stand and let's see you. Thank you for coming. And from Pickens County, we're in Pickens County. Thank you for coming as well. And from uh, Freeman County. Thank you. Thank all of you for being here and we hope your experience today is both interesting and instructive and that many of you will be inspired to go into the law. 
and we appreciate uh, your academic uh, excellence. We appreciate uh, your academic challenge, and we we hope for each of you the very best in your academic careers and your lives to come. So, welcome to each and every one of you here today. And thank you, thank you very much on behalf of the whole court for such a warm and wonderful welcome that you extended to us as we come from Old Court. Before we begin, and uh, let me ask everyone if you would please take just a moment and silence or turn off any cell phones or any other uh, electronic device that could conceivably uh, make some sort of distracting noise during the arguments that we're going to hear this morning. Uh, it is very distracting should that occur, and it's just easier if we go ahead and solve that problem by turning them off or silencing them before we begin. Ms. Barnes, I can't see you. There you are. Okay. Do we have any requests for admission this morning? Yes, Your Honor. The following named applicants have properly certified applications. And I respectfully move for their admission to the bar of the Supreme Court of Georgia. If each of you would please come forward before the bench as your name is called uh, so that we can administer the oath. Devin Arnold, Philip Lohman, Joshua Teague, Frank Woodford. <coughs> Let me ask each of you to raise your right hand and repeat this oath after me. I do solemnly swear that I will conduct myself as an attorney or counselor of this court truly and honestly, justly and uprightly, and according to law, and that I will support the Constitution of the State of Georgia and the Constitution of the United States. So now we got. Well, congratulations to each of you. While we're all very, very proud of you, Justice Melton has some special words he'd like to impart to you this time. Thank you, Chief. On behalf of Chief Justice Thompson, Presiding Justice Hines, Justice Benham, Justice Hunstein, Justice Namius, and Justice Blackwell, it is an honor to be able to be here for you in your home and uh, welcome you as the newest members to our court. Uh, I want you to know how much we, we enjoy as a court coming on the road and experiencing the hospitality uh, of this community. And for me personally, it's a moment of clarity. It reminds me of how I want to be treated all day, every day. And so <laughs> I, I appreciate the, the increased vision that I have going forward. Uh, but it's going to be a hard road to, to match. So. Uh, thank you and everybody here for your hospitality. Uh, I like competition. And last night at dinner, uh, at the table we were at, we had a good view of the Auburn Tigers playing Kentucky one by three. Went back to the hotel and watched the Falcons. Uh, so I like competition. And it reminds me that lawyers are, the, the, the criminal and civil justice system is in competition. There are many ways for people to resolve disputes. And we like the way that we offer our community. But we are, we are in competition with other forms of dispute resolution. Some of those forms aren't bad. You know, we can make peace very easily with the idea that people that we are in contact with might want to go to their church or their pastor or somebody they respect in, 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 in an effort to resolve disputes. Uh, we might even encourage that. I can make a strong case for that, we, that we have obligation to encourage that. We also have mediators and arbitration. So losing out to those forms of dispute resolution really isn't a bad thing. It's the aggressive self-help forms of dispute resolution that we really want to discourage. And we want, and we want to make sure that the criminal justice system and the civil justice system is within reach, but also that it's viewed as a viable option. And you are our poster children for that. As you interact with your community, as you uh, interact with the ticket counter when your flight's delayed, you are being watched and people are looking at you as a representation of our judicial system. And even when you have your client before our court or any other court, how you talk about the judges, how you talk about the system, how you talk about your opposing counsel, how you talk about your adversary, 
has a lot to do with their view of the system that we're asking them to participate in. As judges, we don't have access to the military. We don't control the government fisc. We wear robes and sit high up, and that's all we have. And we ask at the end of the day that when we issue decisions as judges that you and your clients not necessarily like the answer, but you accept the answer. And that's a tough pill to swallow. Uh, but you're the ones that make that interchange possible. How you translate what we say, how you encourage your clients to take the answer and say, thank you, Your Honor, yes, Your Honor, and move forward knowing that the answer has, in fact, been answered. So we thank you for the role that you play in that process. We look forward to having you in our court. We thank you for the role that you play in your community. And now we have to ask you to follow our clerk out and do whatever it takes to finalize this transaction so you will indeed be officially authorized to practice before our court. Thank you, and we wish you well. Good luck with each other. Okay. Board of Blue, what's the last one to do? Down to the middle aisle to Miss Littlefield. Back, back by the exit sign. We have two very important <coughs> and also very interesting cases to be argued this morning. Uh, our course of events probably will be that we will hear the first case and take a short recess and come back and hear the second case. Uh, each of the cases is allotted 20 minutes per side for argument. Uh, don't have to take the full 20 minutes, but uh, if you do take the full 20 minutes, we'll sign the bell, signifying the time that's expired. Those participating in argument will have to keep up and keep track of their own time. We do have a clock on the bench that will help you uh, do that. But um, Ms. Warren, you may call the first case. Yes, Your Honor. S15G1130, Miguel Overa et al. versus University System of Georgia's Board of Regents et al. Charles Cuck for appellant, Russ Willard for appellate. representative attorney to the 39 Georgia residents seeking to pay in-state tuition, but are being deprived of doing so because of a misinterpretation of the rules of the Board of Regents. The issue before the court today is whether or not these students can proceed forward with their litigation, which is a simple declaratory judgment action under the Declaratory Judgment Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Constitution of the State of Georgia. The Superior Court in this case, as well as the Court of Appeals, both held that the sovereign immunity provisions of the Georgia Constitution barred us from proceeding on a declaratory judgment action, even though these students seek nothing more than a clarification of what state rules are as promulgated by the Board of Regents. We believe that the Declaratory Judgment Act itself is quite clear and provides direct authority and a waiver of sovereign immunity to proceed forward. The Declaratory Judgment Act in OCGA 9-4-2 says specifically that any party, any party, can bring an action under the Declaratory Judgment Act to seek a clarification of their rights under the law, or the contracts, or any other provision. And that's all we seek here today. We're not looking for injunctive relief, which this court has barred from moving forward uh, in its Center for Sustainable Coast case. We have not filed a mandamus action, which itself may be permissible under this court's case decisions in Southern versus Southern LNG. What we want to do is be able to go back to the Superior Court and have that judge tell us whether or not the Board of Regents' use of the words lawful presence actually include these 39 Georgia residents. At the end of the day, the simple language of the statute must be given its plain meaning. The words any party, as promulgated by the state legislature, must mean any party. Now, but, that's, totally but that's not how we do sovereign immunity waivers. The, the fact that 
I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry over here. Um, the fact the fact that a statute applies generally to a class of people is not a waiver of sovereign immunity. It has to either expressly say that the state waives its immunity from suit, or it has to be the necessary implication, for example, mandamus, which wouldn't make any sense because it can only apply to government actors. So what's your authority for saying a statute that says any person is a waiver of sovereign immunity? If that's the case, virtually every statute says everybody can sue, everything would be a waiver of sovereign immunity. Thank you, Justice Amanda. Here's our position on this. Yes, in fact, we know that any party could meet any party under any statute. But the argument here is whether or not there is an express waiver under the Georgia Constitution, as, as, as it says in the provision of the Constitution on sovereign immunity, for us to award a declaratory judgment. If there is a bar to sovereign, by sovereign immunity under the Declaratory Judgment Act itself, for moving forward just under that act, then our, then our plaintiffs would have no opportunity to challenge the decision of the state court. At the end of the day, the issue is really quite simple. Can a state agency create a rule, use ordinary language in that rule, interpret it contrary to its plain meaning, and not be held accountable at all? Well, there are two problems with that. One is sovereign immunity, where it applies, does exactly that. Sovereign immunity, the whole idea of sovereign immunity is you, you can't challenge what the government did. When, if anyone else did it, you might be able to challenge it. So that argument is just an argument against the existence of sovereign immunity. The second argument, that you can't challenge it at all, why can't you challenge this through a personal, through an action against the individual officers under mandamus, in the way we explained at the end of the Supreme Coast, in the way that Justice Benham's dissent in the IBM case explained you could do, in the way that we explained back in a 1948 case called Musgrove, that that's how you do it. You don't sue the state. You, you tell the individual officer um, you are violating a clear legal duty. Each of those cases specifically require that there be wrongdoing on part of that officer. We're not alleging wrongdoing on part of the Board of Regents here. We're simply claiming that they're misinterpreting their rule. They're relying on the Attorney General's opinion, we believe, although we haven't seen that. So the question is, do we sue the individual members of the Board of Regents? We believe we don't have authority to do that, and that's why we want to proceed. Mr. Cook, what is your best authority for your position? The best authority for our position is the Administrative Procedures Act. It's specifically... You're arguing, you're arguing the language of the Act. Is exactly that? right. Uh, the Administrative Procedures Act, secondarily to the Declaratory Judgment Act, authorizes declaratory judgment actions against any state agency for interpretations of rules or other policies. And we understand that there is an exception to that for interpretive rules, which I'll get into in a second. But the express language of the Administrative Procedures Act applies by the president of this court to the Board of Regents. What's your best case for that proposition? Kitchens, Your Honor. The case specifically says that the Board of Regents is an agency and subject to suit. Also, there's the red and black um, um, in the newspaper case against, uh, against the Board of Regents, which was an open records case, which again found the Board of Regents was an agency for purposes of the Open Records Act. That, that might get you over the agency hump of the APA, but our precedents say to be a rule that is covered by 50, 13, 10, it has to be a rule that was promulgated through the APA process. Well, that, that's what we say. Um, and this rule, there's no argument that the rule or policy at issue were promulgated through the APA process. No, right? It's quite clear that the Board of Regents Justice has not been following the APA. But there's never been a decision of this court saying that they're exempted from following the APA. The well, fact that the well if, you're, if your problem is that they didn't invoke this rule through the APA, then that's a different lawsuit. That's a lawsuit saying this rule is non-existent because you didn't follow the APA. Thank you. I mean, I understand that argument, Justice, but the problem here is they haven't been following the rule. So if they intentionally don't follow the APA, how are we supposed to get justice other than coming forward and saying, I want to make an entire argument on why they should follow the APA? The that, state that's how you would do it. The state you legislature... Would bring, you would make that argument that they aren't following the APA. But you didn't make that argument. You make the argument that you're entitled to sue them for not enforcing their rule, but their rule is is clearly not what we said in, in our only precedence on the issue. We have said that you cannot use 5013, whatever it is, 5313 10, unless the rule is promulgated under the notice and comment process. 
I understand that precedent, but at the end of the day, we have no other option to move forward with the declaratory judgment act. Now, this court may find that there is no jurisdiction for us to proceed and throw us out. And that would then put us in a situation where we were before, maybe we'll file a mandamus action where there's clearly authority to move forward. But we believe that the APA language itself gives us that authority. The board did not follow the APA. Whether it did or not is irrelevant because this is not an interpretive rule. This is not an interpretive rule. The Georgia Policy and Procedure Manual was promulgated directly as a result of the Georgia State Legislature's decision in OCGA 20-3-66D to allow the Board of Regents to set tuition policy for individuals who are not U.S. citizens of the United States. The agency then went about and set that policy in their policy manual. That policy manual has the effect of a rule and a regulation. The fact that they had not gone through the process may be a violation of their own, and we have not alleged that. I acknowledge we have not alleged that. At the same time, this opportunity was presented before us today to say that they should not only should have done so, but in and of itself, without even going through the APA, it is a rule. It also doesn't require that there be a specific rule, because it can also be a policy or an opinion. This is none of those things as far as interpretation of the law is concerned. So we believe that the Administrative Procedures Act, coupled with the Declaratory Judgment Act, gives us the authority to move forward. Isn't the Roy Davis case a problem for you? And, and do you think Roy Davis was correctly decided? It did have three members of the court concurring in judgment only who did not join the opinion. I don't see the, the Roy Davis opinion as a problem for our case, because it doesn't decide this exact issue that we have before. This, this issue is unique, I believe, within Georgia precedent. There's no case that controls exactly a declaratory judgment action in this situation. So no, I don't see that as a problem. Can it, just to be clear, because you started on the General Declaratory Judgment Act, now you're on the APA Declaratory Judgment. Which do you think is, is, if you have a winning argument, where is it? Well, I think they're all winning arguments, Justice, so I appreciate that. But I, our strongest argument is through the APA Declaratory Judgment process, which invokes the Declaratory Judgment Act as a process, as a process by which we can proceed in the state court. But if, if that's your ground, then we, it seems like we would have to overrule Roy Davis, because Roy Davis says, as clear as day, and then was followed up by a Court of Appeals opinion, which is also precedent, that says, it is not a rule for purposes of that statute, that APA Declaratory Judgment statute. It is not the rule within that, unless it was promulgated through the notice and comment rulemaking process. Well, if that would, if, if it requires the court to overrule Roy Davis, it absolutely should do that. Okay, and, and if you want us to do that, you've made no stare decisis arguments. That's a opinion about a statute. If we got it wrong 20 or 30 years ago, that's something the legislature could fix. They haven't done that. What is, why would we overrule a statutory precedent? You would overrule the statutory precedent or the decision in Roy Davis, because it's the right thing to do. Well, Mr. Cook, are you arguing that Roy Davis should be overruled, or are you trying to distinguish it? I'm distinguishing Roy Davis. At the end of the day, I don't think Roy Davis says that the board's policies and procedures have to go through the APA if they negatively affect individuals and they're purposely being misinterpreted. I think the Administrative Procedures Act still allows this court to, to permit a, a declaratory judgment action to move forward in this case. Now, there's another reason we believe that exists, because, to, to establish jurisdiction here, and that's within the very words of the Georgia Constitution itself. Now, I know that the state has kind of set aside our argument, kind of, kind of made fun of it a little bit, but we have a right to seek a petition for redress of our grievances. Now, the state's Supreme Court has only issued a couple of opinions on that, and none since the Supreme Court's, since the Georgia Constitution was modified in 1991 and re-adopted. But the right to seek a petition for redress of grievances cannot be ignored. It cannot be superseded by another provision of the Constitution. Do you have any case, I mean, that, the, the petition clause in the Georgia Constitution, which is similar to the petition clause in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, as far as I know, has always been interpreted as your right to petition the legislative and executive branches of government for the redress of grievances, or to go to court. You've been entitled to go to court. No one is keeping you out of court. Do you have anything that says you're entitled to win? I believe that this, this court's opinion in Daniel v. State and Berry Hill v. Berry Hill v. Georgia Community Support and Solutions, Inc., give us the right to move forward in court. Because, Justice. If that were true, then sovereign immunity could never apply. 
I disagree. Sovereign immunity can apply. Sovereign immunity is designed and specifically read into the Constitution for two, at least two reasons that Justice Bennett has pointed out in his dissent in Southern LNG. The primary reason in which it comes across very strongly within the sovereign immunity bar in the Constitution is a money issue. You can't allow the judges to go around making the state spend money or have people sue the state to spend money. We're not asking for that here. We're simply asking for a simple clarification of what words mean within a policy and regulation adopted by the Board of Regents. Well, that, that is not the, the sole purpose of sovereign immunity. And in addition, while you are saying you only want a declaratory judgment, the effect of that declaratory judgment will be to require the state to pay money, right? Absolutely not, Justice. There is no requirement that the state ever pay money to the state. What we're arguing for is the in-state okay, commission. Okay, well, sorry. That you, you're requiring the state to collect less money from the people it's educating, um, so the state will end up paying more money. The state is going to have the same money expended for education. The question is how much it gets back in the form of tuition. Right. Your, your point is well taken, but here's the point. Many more students will go to school paying in-state tuition because they're deprived of that right now. I have these young men and young women taking one or two classes at a time paying $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 of credit out. When they can be paying far less, taking a full ride, and when they graduate much faster, paying much higher taxes in the state of Georgia, with a greater proportion of these young men, young men and young women attending schools, and not getting loans, it's not costing them a dime in home scholarship, not getting any provisions to lower their tuition, other than whether they meet the standard of in-state tuition, which they all meet, as well as meeting the standard for being a Georgia resident under the, under the clauses adopted by the, by the Board of Regents. So no, I completely, completely disagree that this costs the state money. I think this makes the state money in the long run. So in, in conclusion, and I want to say the rest of my time for rebuttal, the court has a choice. Whether or not you are going to allow a state agency to make rules, interpret them any way they want, even contrary to their accepted meaning, and then go ahead and say you can't challenge that. What that means for my parents, for my plaintiffs, for my kids, is they have deprived their right to an education. They're deprived of their hope and their dream to move forward in this state, a state they consider their home, a state they grew up in. And they have, they're going to be deprived of the right to contribute to this state in the best possible manner because their education is going to be I'm sorry. Bottom line is, Mr. Cook, you, you are challenging your argument, though. The, the underpinning of it is statutory language. Is that exactly right? Exactly correct, Your Honor. Can I ask again, why can you not, if, if you are right about the law, that it, there is a clear legal duty for the state to do what you want. Why can you not sue the individual members of the Board of Regents in mandamus and say you are violating a clear legal duty and win? Why is that not the approach that our cases support? We said you could do in Sustainable Coast. We said you could do 50 years ago in Musgrove. But instead, you want us to overrule cases. You want us to create new sovereign immunity law. Why not? Why not Justice, take that I'm not asking to create new sovereign immunity law. This court is allowed declaratory judgment actions to go forward against the Board of Regents and other state agencies for 50 years. This is this is what, what the state's asking is you actually create new law, and that you bar individuals from moving forward on declaratory judgment. In, in any of those cases, was the issue of sovereign immunity for declaratory judgments raised? On several of them, they were actually were, and they said declaratory judgments could go forward. In that, in well, that what's action. your best case for that problem? Oh, Justice, I'm sorry, I don't have a tip my tongue. Well, allow me to address that. Not, not a case where we actually just said you can do a declaratory judgment, but we actually went through a sovereign immunity analysis. No, Justice, there is no case in which there's a sovereign immunity analysis, but sovereign immunity was clearly brought up as a case by the state, and that case was allowed to go forward in the declaratory judgment. Thank you. All right. Mr. Willard? <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and please the court. My name is Russell Willard, and I represent the Board of Regents in this action for declaratory relief. There are only two issues before the court today. The first is whether the sovereign immunity reserved by the state protects the state from actions for declaratory relief. And two, if so, whether there has been a clear and unambiguous waiver of that sovereign immunity that would permit appellate actions for declaratory relief to proceed. Mr. Willard, Mr. Willard, when you are arguing this, are you looking at injunctive relief and declaratory relief differently or is it at all? Justice Hines, they are all actions at law. They are all protected. The state's protection under sovereign immunity applies to all those actions absent an express waiver. 
there is no distinction in Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 9 between actions for declaratory relief and actions for injunctive relief. Here, the immunity reserved to the state, as I said, as sovereign in Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 9, applies with equal force to all actions of law, including declaratory relief. And there has likewise been no clear and unambiguous waiver of that sovereign immunity are guaranteed under Paragraph E of Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 9, that would permit this action to proceed. The existence of a potential assertion of sovereign immunity is a threshold question that any court in which that issue is raised must dispose of before allowing the legal process to proceed. Applying the rationale of this court in its Sustainable Coast decision, the trial court found that sovereign immunity barred claims for declaratory judgment actions against the sovereign in the same manner that claims for injunctive relief had been barred by this court in Sustainable Coast. The grant of sovereign immunity reserved by the state within the Article 1 provision is clear on its face. The state, as the body politic of the people of Georgia, has established, as, has established courts for the adjudication of disputes between individual litigants. The extension of that is that the people, through the agencies and officials in whom they have entrusted the discharge of their duties and obligations, cannot be hauled into the courts that the state itself has created, absent a grant by the people through their elected representatives in the General Assembly that expressly waives the sovereign immunity that the people have reserved under Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 9. So why is the Administrative Procedures Act in this case not a waiver? Your Honor, I want to touch on something that Justice Thomas had raised in his questioning of my opponent here. The waiver in 5013.10 is only applicable to those state agencies that fall within the definition of agency as it is defined within the APA. It doesn't matter how someone may be defined as an agency within the Open Records Act. That doesn't carry over. The General Assembly has specifically defined who is an agency, or rather who is not an agency, within the APA, and that definition governs for this action. In Title 50, is the definition for open records different than the APA definition? It is, Your Honor. There is a specific definition of agency within the APA, just as there is a specific definition of agency within both the Open Meetings Act and the Open Records Act. And those are applicable only to those chapters within which they fall. So then the university system regents has no rules at all under the APA? That is correct, Your Honor, for multiple decades, going back 60 years. The General Assembly and regents have treated regents and their individual institutions as falling outside the APA. There's been no legislative intent to recapture them within the APA. They have existed separate and apart from the agencies that are covered under the APA. There have been no rules adopted by regents that have ever gone through the notice and comment provision of the APA because they aren't covered under the APA. Which of the enumerated exceptions in 5013-2 does the Board of Regents fall under? If you'll give me a second, I'll read you the exact language. Justice Blackwell, the APA excludes from the definition of agency any, quote, school, college, hospital, or other such educational, idiomocenary, or charitable institution. And your position is that the various institutions that make up the university system in Georgia are indistinguishable in law from the Board of Regents, and therefore, if those individual schools had a separate legal existence, it's kind of given to the Board of Regents. Justice Blackwell, that's exactly not only my point, that's this Court's point in its prior precedent. That's how the General Assembly views it. That's how the trial courts of the state of Georgia view it. Well, here's my difficulty with that as a matter of construction. Does Chattahoochee Tech down here have a separate legal existence from the technical college system of Georgia? Your Honor, we're not dealing with the technical college system of Georgia, which is also specifically excluded from that. And I think what you see in the definition portion of the APA is a recognition that over time, originally, the individual institutions of the university system had separate legal existence. McCafferty recognized that. But those gradually folded in, and as this Court recognized in McCafferty, they are now indistinguishable. Regents are its institutions, its institutions are regents, and the individual institutions have no legally separate and legally cognizable existence 
outside of regions. As such, if you read out college in the context that it was determined at the time that that provision was written, when the technical colleges were technical schools and vocational schools, at that point in time when that exception was written, if you read regions out of that exception, then that language, college, is mere surplusage, which is not recognized by this court's precedent as a viable rule of statutory construction. We have to give meaning to that word. Uh, of course, if it pulls in Board of Regents, it should also pull in the technical college system, which makes the express exemption for the technical college system surplusage. Your Honor, like I said, I think at some point you have to recognize the fact that over the decades this uh, act was amended, at the time you had the Department of Technical and Adult Education. It wasn't the technical college system of Georgia. It's only been within the last decade that it became the technical college system of Georgia. And at the time that you had DTAE, those were schools. They were not part of any sort of college system as it was statutorily recognized. And you can't say that we've given form and substance to something that the General Assembly wrote 30 years ago by saying that they meant they just held off on it for 20 years and then gave it form and meaning 10 years ago when they changed DTAE to TCSGA. Regents and the General Assembly have operated for decades under the correct interpretation of the APA of the APA that Regents is not subject to the APA. As I stated earlier, the contents of Regents policy manual at issue here were not adopted pursuant to the APA's rulemaking procedures. Under this court's prior precedent then, even if Regents were mistakenly found to be an agency under the APA, then under Roy Davis, the policy issue at issue here are not subject to the APA judicial review process. The exclusion by Regents from the APA's terms is a common sense one from the General Assembly's perspective. Following the accreditation concerns of the University of Georgia during the Eugene Talmadge administration, the people of Georgia insulated regents from the whims of the General Assembly and the governors that followed Talmadge through the enactment of the Article 8 provision which vests exclusive control of the university <coughs> system of Georgia within the Board of Regents. As such, the General Assembly is constitutionally forbidden from interfering with rules or policies promulgated by regents for the operation of the university system. If regents were to be covered by the APA, the constitutionally forbidden would necessarily follow through the ability of the General Assembly to legislatively veto policies of regents through the legislative review process of the APA. This court has already recognized the dangers of that line of reasoning, finding that subsuming the Board of <coughs> Reporting under the APA would interfere with the inherent power of the judicial branch in Brown and Gallup. The Pandora's box of allowing the General Assembly to tread upon constitutionally delegated authority is no less dangerous here than it was when dealing with the Board of Court Reporting. Has that been clearly stated that the General Assembly cannot interfere with regents as clearly as you stated? Your Honor, this court has on multiple occasions tried to avoid defining that Article 8 parameter. And that goes to your principle of constitutional avoidance. You don't want to get into a situation where the constitutionally delegated authority of the General Assembly is coming into conflict with the constitutionally delegated authority of regents, in this case, the exclusive authority to operate and control the university system of Georgia. And as such, this court should take the opportunity to re-give the term college within the APA its normal and ordinary usage and find that the university system is excluded from that to avoid the implications, because if you do not read college within the APA as including regions, like you did in Brown and Gallo, where you said that Board of Court Reporting was included within the, the judiciary, you have the issue that you have to deal with of the potential conflict between the Article 8 provisions and the authority of the can, General Assembly. Can't we avoid all of that by just saying under Roy Davis? Uh, unless it went through the APA rulemaking process, it, it is not subject to 5013-10. Your Honor, you cannot have to make the law that you're pressing us to make on colleges and the APA in general. 
That's what the Court of Appeals did, Your Honor, but they, they skipped a step. We're not talking about constitutional avoidance here. And I think before you get to that, the court needs to address whether or not the APA would even apply to Regents before you get into whether it's an interpretive rule, as opposed to just saying, that doesn't even matter. We're just going to go ahead and jump forward three chapters in the book and say it's an interpretive rule under Roy Davis and not get it. Why? I mean, we do that all the time. We take the easiest way to resolve a matter rather than making new law on a more complicated point. Your Honor, I understand under Roy Davis that you can have the, we can decide that on a contingent basis and say that it is an interpretive rule because it didn't go through the APA rulemaking process. But that leaves open the question that is squarely before the court today as to whether Regents is part of the APA. Because I would put to the court that if you leave that open, eventually you are going to have to deal with it. Okay, how about if your other us rules in skew on that point and then you went under Roy Davis or would you rather us skip that point and you went under Roy Davis? Your Honor, I'll be honest with you. I'm comfortable with the arguments that I've made as to why the Board of Regents is excluded under the definition of agency under the APA. But you also say that you would, in your opinion, you prevail under Roy Davis, are you not? That is correct, Justice Hines. It's clear under Roy Davis that these rules are not subject to judicial review. If the court were to get to that point and you have a multi-step analysis, we've raised the issue of sovereign immunity. You first have to find that sovereign immunity applies to declaratory judgment action. At that point, you begin looking for the waiver. I think the court has recognized the weakness in Appellant's case that there is no express waiver of sovereign immunity within the general declaratory judgment action found in Title IX. Let me ask you about Roy Davis. What are the limits of that? Can an agency really avoid review just by not promulgating rules the right way? Your Honor, an agency that is subject to the APA, that doesn't promulgate rules the right way, incurs the attendant, for lack of a better description, infirmities of rules adopted that way. They don't have the force and effect of law the same as policy manuals, interpretive rules do. If the agency is treating it that way, then it has very much the same force and effect. It does within the agency, but then it doesn't contain the ability to have judicial deferment to the agency's interpretation of that rule that has gone through the notice and comment period. There wouldn't be a judicial deferment if they can't get in court because it's not a rule. Your Honor, in that instance, you would have the ability of the General Assembly to come in through its process of overseeing agencies that are subject to the APA and directing the agency and modifying the APA in a way to direct them to actually adopt rules pursuant to the APA or taking away or limiting their rulemaking authority and their promulgating authority going forward to say that they can't offer interpretive rules that take place outside of a given case parameter. Counsel, help me understand the Roy Davis decision. Now, we may follow it right or wrong as a matter of stare decisis, but as I understand it, Section 2 of the APA defines rules. Then Section 4 of the APA says some but not all rules have to go through notice and comment rulemaking. Then you get over to Section 10, and it says the validity of any rule, not rules that were subject to notice and comment rulemaking, not the rules covered by Section 4. It says any rule. Why does that not refer to the Section 2 definition of a rule? Your Honor, I think there you go, and it's how this Court has interpreted those statutory provisions of Roy Davis. You have a Venn diagram. One circle contains all the rules that were adopted pursuant to the notice and comment process, and then everything else goes into the other circle. And if they go in that other circle under Roy Davis, they are not subject to judicial review. And I think that's a clear line of cases and is justified procedurally when you look at the notice and comment period and the fact that we're promulgating rules under the APA pursuant to notice and comment that are going to have the force and effect of law not only within the agency but also in any judicial review. Also, if any challenges take place outside of the APA context, then talk about those definitions and talk about those policies. There is deferral to that because the General Assembly has implicitly signed off on that by not legislatively vetoing those provisions. And in this case, once again, I come back to if you're going to say that Regents is subject to the APA, 
you were treading extraordinarily close to creating a potential conflict between the provisions of the APA, as this court recognized in Brown and Gallo, where you have independent constitutional authority within which the General Assembly cannot tread. And we're saying that, no, 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 for the purposes of legislative review, legislative veto, we're going to allow you to go there. You would have to overrule Brown and Gallo to do that because of the Article 8 provision that says Regents has exclusive management and control of the University System of Georgia. What about mandamus? I mean, the, the hard question in sovereign immunity is is always, is there any remedy if, the, if state officials are just blatantly violating the law, is there some remedy? It seems like the remedy we've left open, as, as we've said, sovereign immunity bars injunctive relief or declaratory relief, is, well, if you can sue individual officers in sovereign immunity, I mean, in mandamus, do you agree with that? Your Honor, I'm not going to address uh, and put potential theories into my opponent's mind, and, and I take issue with the fact that this court's analysis of sovereign immunity needs to take into account alternative methods of challenging an agency action. Sovereign immunity is a harsh doctrine. This court has recognized it. There may be instances where there is no judicial remedy for particular litigants in a particular matter. Well, that is the basis of sovereignty. I, I do think it's important to consider um, if a citizen is faced with a situation where he or she absolutely does not know what to do and the sheriff or the state is coming in uh, with tanks and guns and threatening to take action unless you do what they are what they say you need to do and you think no that's completely wrong I'm not required to do that our our culture our society is based on the notion that you can get some form of clarity some kind of way without having to suffer the threat of what government might do so what would be the way to accomplish that Justice Melton without going down a rabbit hole of hypotheticals in terms of the situation guns and tanks. Well, let's talk but, about this case. What would be the way to get clarity? Your Honor, counsel has raised the petition of grievances provision of the state constitution. And there is no impediment. In fact, I believe the Chancellor and the Board of Regents are on record as having met with individuals on this particular matter. But clarity is in terms of what the law requires on the front end on, on issues where a state is taking a position that citizens disagree with. I, what is the mechanism to get clarity from the state? It, except, and I think here it's particularly informative to look at it through the prism of the facts of this particular case. We're not talking about a situation where regents have adopted rules that fly in the face of federally mandated rights what or state mandated what this, rights. These are rights that Okay, I really need to answer your question. What, what if a citizen was faced with a situation where the regent was taking a position that clearly was contrary to federal law? What could that citizen do to get clarity? In that case, if they're taking a position contrary to federal law, you have the entire federal court system. All right, state law then. In ter and, and once again, it turns on how you're posing that conflict. Because as I said, Justice Mel, that's the fatal flaw in appellant's case. In this instance, the rights that they're asking to be enforced are only created through their interpretation right, but of let's say they're policy right. manual. Let's say they're, they're entirely right about their interpretation of the policy manual, and let's say there was a statute that said that's the only possible interpretation of the policy manual. What would be their remedy? And the Board of Regents says, you know what, we just don't feel like following the law today. What, what can they do anything about that other than go to the Board of Regents and then say, you know, it was nice meeting with you, but we don't feel like following the law today. You may ask the question. Thank you, Chief Justice. In terms of, you had mentioned if Regents adopted a policy that flew in the face of a clear statutory uh, provision. I'm, am I understanding your question correctly, Justice yes. Thomas? All right. In this case, you would have a fatal flaw in the statute itself because of the Article 8 provision. The only way Regents' policy for the operation of the University System of Georgia comes into conflict with a General Assembly enacted statutory provision is if 
the General Assembly has overstepped its authority and enacted a statute that goes to operation and control of the university system of Georgia, which it is constitutionally forbidden to do under our collective. Can I ask one follow-up question? Sure. So, for example, anti-discrimination laws, if, if the General Assembly passes a general anti-discrimination law, the Board of Regents is not covered by that law? All right. There you're going outside the operation and control of the university system of Georgia. And the General Assembly has the authority no, no, to enact no, no. laws in general Any dis employment discrimination law. The part of the operation of the university system right. is employing people, hiring and firing them. So an anti a general anti-discrimination law, state law, could not, would be unconstitutional as applied to the Board of Regents. I, 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 would, I would not, I would not advise Regents that it was following, that it was tacking within Article 8 if it attempted to make that argument. Our office would not be making that argument to them, much in the same way that they can't adopt a policy that violates the federal land of discrimination laws because that would allow them to go to federal court and get it. We have cases, Your Honor, where the General Assembly has adopted laws of general import that cut across more than just the university system, such as the Open Records Act. And those laws are treated as separate and apart from the management and control of the university system and are found to be applicable to people, much as they were in the red and black case. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord. That's good. Your vote? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask you with, with the questions of my colleagues, and it looks like, why did you determine not to pursue the mandate for now? We thought the simplest process was simply to seek a clarification of what the law said. And we believe that once the board was presented with the decision from the Superior Court judge saying, here's what the words lawful presence mean, they would follow it. It was quite clear from our experience with the Board of Regents from the state legislature tried to step in in 2010 and mandate who could and could not pay in-state tuition. But the Board of Regents wanted to say, well, wait a second, we'll take care of that. We have authority over this. Let us do that. And that's when they stepped in and created the definition of for in-state tuition purposes. But was your complaint filed before or after our decision on sustainable codes? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Was your complaint filed before or after our decision on sustainable codes? It was filed before in August 2013, but we didn't have a hearing on the case until after the decision on sustainable codes. So at that point, it was a little, little vague about how we could proceed. We believe that the Court of Judgment was the best piece of this process. Now, I want to get to the issue of this interpreter rule process, and as well as whether the Board of Regents is an agency. This, this Court uh, and the Court of Appeals in the kitchen said specifically that the Board of Regents is not covered as an educational institution. Now, this Court last year ruled in, in the Gallo case, Brown and Gallo case, that the words judiciary under the exception for uh, whether, whether somebody is an agency was broad enough to include the Judicial Council. The state is actually arguing the exact opposite of that here. They're saying that the words educational institution means something that is not actually an educational institution. So there's no need to overturn Brown and Gallo here. Brown and Gallo was clear. You had a general word like judiciary. It was clearly protected within, within the Constitution. And clearly included the Judicial Council, which was one created by the judiciary. But here, the Board of Regents has separately sat apart from edge as an educational institution since 1931. And since 1931, the Board of Regents has not changed the definition for what an exception to the APA is. They've had plenty of time to do so. Nobody's forgot about the Board of Regents. What the state's asking you to do today is to find something that's never found before, and that would require you to overturn the Court of Appeals decision in Kitchens where it specifically found that the Board of Regents was not an educational institution and thus subject to the APA. In fact, the Board of Regents itself has simply ignored the fact that they're subject to the APA for the last 50 years. I can do nothing about it. Perhaps this court can. My concern here today is whether that allows us to go forward in a declaratory judgment process and thus enables us to seek the relief we need, which is a simple clarification of the law. I want to briefly address the Roy Davis case as well. Uh, Justice, my, you said specifically that the, 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 the Roy Davis case requires that there actually be an enactment of the rule. I don't think the Roy Davis case says that. The Roy Davis case was about a form and whether or not that form had gone through the APA. And the simple statement was, oh, you didn't, go through, you didn't go through the APA. We don't have to follow it. It's an interpretive rule. And then cited an earlier case, which specifically was about a, a, a legal opinion within the agency that said, oh, yeah, it's a legal opinion. It's not a rule. Uh, Justice Blackwell, you said specifically what a rule is. By the way, section four, not section six. Or section six, not section four. But where rule is defined. But rule means anything. And these, this policy manual, 
That is the that is the entire set of regulations for the Board of Regents because they have not complied with the APA. So we believe there still lies here for us a declaratory judgment route through the Administrative Procedures Act that gets us back in front of the Superior Court judge so we can get a decision that will hopefully, we believe, positively affect the lives of my clients. If there's no further questions, I want to thank the court for the opportunity to present to you. Thank, thank you. you. If you would have a seat for a second. Let me, on behalf of the court, uh, extend our thanks to both sides for the excellent briefing and the excellent arguments uh, presented on this case that will be very helpful to us at least in the proper decision in this important case. And I also want to thank you too for volunteering to come up to beautiful Gilman County to uh, uh, enlighten us with your arguments today. I know you didn't have to do that, and we appreciate very much uh, your willingness to be part of this uh, day. I neglected, I see somebody I overlooked when we were doing introductions earlier. I want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Nell Benham, uh, spouse of uh, my good friend, Bob Benham. Nell, would st please stand. Thank you for coming up with us. A couple of other spouses are actually on tour of your beautiful community, and uh, they're not with us, but uh, not physically anyway. They're certainly with us in spirit. But, uh, and I, I note in the room uh, that everybody's been very attentive, very quiet, but I also feel there's a little tension. So we're going to take about a 10 or 12 minute recess <laughs> and give everybody an opportunity if you'd like to do quiet, do quiet talking or uh, anything else you need to do. But in about about 12 minutes or so, we're going to come back and hear the last case. So be back when we ready then. All rise. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of the way.